Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Harvard Business School. My name is Andy Story. I'm on the leadership team here at uh, D Cubed. It's a pleasure to be able to welcome so many folks here in person uh, on campus. And I think that we're joined uh, virtually with participants and representatives of just about every continent around the world, with the exception of Antarctica. Uh, so thank you so much for, for participating with us today. Um, we have a fantastic series of presentations, of keynotes, uh, of panels. Um, we also have a design workshop to look forward to tomorrow. And of course, the all important uh, networking opportunities that uh, uh, events like this uh, permit. Uh, we live in an incredible age of technological change and challenge. Um, and at DCubed, um, we very much want to try and play our part to, to help solve all of those challenges. Um, we are actively recruiting. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, uh, say that to, to this group, to those folks that are online. If anybody is interested in learning more about DCubes um, as the institute and what our ambition is for the year ahead, uh, and they would be interested in playing a part, um, I would very much look forward to being able to speak and meet with you over the course of uh, today and into tomorrow. Um, just a couple of administrative or housekeeping notes before we get into the content uh, today. Uh, firstly, um, for those folks who are joining us virtually, and um, we're using menti.com, um, if there's any technical issues at all, please go ahead and drop those in the Zoom chat, and we will be very responsive uh, to addressing any of those issues that, that may arise. Also, uh, at DQ, we believe that the best way to learn is through engagement. Um, we just don't want to transmit our content, our ideas, our insights. We want to learn from the, the thought leadership and the practitioner insights that you can offer us um, to really help be a catalyst to all that we do at DCubed. Um, so please do use the Slack link that we have set, and we would love to engage with you uh, during the sessions uh, today, tomorrow on Slack, but also into, uh, into the future. For those folks that are here in the room, um, your class cards, um, if you would either leave them in situ, please, uh, in this classroom at the end of the day, if you want to retain your seat for tomorrow, or please go ahead and leave them with the staff uh, right, right outside, um, so we don't have to uh, replace or find any missing uh, class cards ahead of, uh, ahead of tomorrow. Um, but that concludes the initial introduction and welcome. And delighted to have you here. Uh, thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time to uh, participate. Um, and we'll get right to it. I will hand over to my colleague, Liang, from the uh, Crypto FinTech and Web3 Lab, uh, who's going to lead our first session today. Thanks so much and welcome. Thanks, Andy. All right. And we also have, uh, since we use technology, we also have a panelist who's hybrid. Um, Great, so welcome everyone. Uh, thanks Andy for the opening remarks. Before we start, I just wanna give a great shout out to Jenny who organized this whole thing amongst other projects. Um, but yeah, today let's, let's uh, kick it off. Our first session is gonna be about intellectual property uh, in the age of AI. And one of the reasons we should all care about intellectual property is everything could be derived into intellectual property, whether it's the piece of content you write on the internet, uh, you know, if you own a movie script to software code, you could kind of reason on some level that everything is about intellectual property. Um, so I'll kind of kick this off, do an intro about myself. Uh, as Andy mentioned, my name's Liang Wu. I'm a senior researcher in the uh, crypto lab here. Uh, a lot of my work is really twofold. One is writing case studies, right? At the business school, we teach with case studies, uh, with guests and, and protagonists and leading companies. Uh, so that helps kind of shape the MBA curriculum here and really throughout the uh, rest of the world as well as most uh, other institutions also end up using our case studies. Um, the second thing I really cover is building community, growth, business development, and for DCube and all the labs involved, we care a lot about bringing people on campus and spanning beyond the four walls of Harvard and the business school. Um, I'm really excited for this talk. I would uh, just mention uh, the three of us are recovering consultants, so we decided no slides. We're just gonna have a conversation and allow people to ask questions, because uh, we think that allows for richer things. Um, and with that, I, we will also leave time for audience Q&A uh, so that we get to engage. And the point of this weekend, I think, is to really kind of meet everyone else in the room and kind of build those connections to continue the conversation uh, after this short weekend. Um, so with that, I'd love to just pass it over to uh, our panelists and maybe starting with Allison and then Rachel to just do a brief intro about yourself. Thanks so much, Liang. I'm Allison Gall. I am legal counsel at the Boston Consulting Group, and I work in uh, helping support our software and our data analytics, specifically our AI and ML groups. I am doing an awful lot of Gen AI work these days. Really, night and day, that's pretty much what I do. 
Um, and it's everything from intellectual property to data governance to um, privacy concerns, anything that touches Gen AI, uh, that's what I get to work on. And so it's a lot of fun. I love it. I have a math and computer science background, and I was in intellectual property specific patent law um, related to AI and machine learning before I joined the Boston Consulting Group. And that's kind of the expertise I'm bringing today. Awesome. Rachel? Yes. Hi. Thanks, guys. And I'm so sorry for those of you in the room to not be with you today. This uh, to be with you live. This sounds like such an amazing event. Um, but I'm here in spirit and obviously virtually. Um, my name is Rachel Dooley. I am based out of New York. Um, I'm currently the chief innovation officer at Goodwin Proctor, which is a major international law firm that originated just down the street from where you are all, all are live at the moment. Um, <clears throat> I've been here for about a year. Immediately before that, I was a uh, global managing counsel for McKinsey Digital, which is McKinsey's arm. It's, it's probably exact, the exact counterpart of Allison's on BCG side, um, uh, doing all of the technology enabled services for our clients, including AI transformation, digital transformation, cloud, IoT, the whole gamut. Um, but I was specifically focused on our practice that we called Quantum Black, which was the leading edge um, AI development hub um, and, and delivering services for clients in that space. Um, and then immediately before that, I had actually took a, a big pause from practice to be a jewelry designer and run the Fashion Week circuit I showed in Milan and Paris and, and uh, New York for many, many years. It was wonderful. Um, and I have the, you know, the copyright portfolio, the trademark portfolio. And also like Alison, I originated as a um, a patent litigator. So I've had my fingers in all the different major pillars of IP law, um, sometimes as a user, sometimes just as an administrator, um, but really excited to be here with you guys today and then chatting about this incredibly energized and frenetic and just like, you know, a smash up of so many things happening in the world. This topic is really incredible. So I'm glad to be here to chat about it. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. So um, let me just lay out a, a rough roadmap. Um, as Rachel and Alistair mentioned, IP is a complex uh, two-word acronym, right, with a lot of things going on. So I think for today, we want to just kind of take a step back. Uh, first, just think about what IP is and understanding why it's even important. Uh, then talk a little bit about how the landscape is changing in light of technologies like generative AI and, and, and other Web3 technologies. And then really kind of close off Musing a little bit about IP in the era of the internet. I always joke to people, the biggest country in the world is actually the internet because we're all on it and it's global. Um, and so it's really important to understand how that works. So maybe to kick it off, um, Allison, would love for you to just high level, like why does the concept of like intellectual property even matter? Like why should we even be here on a Friday afternoon talking about this? I love that we're starting this conference off actually with a talk about IP, not just because it gives me a job, but uh, because I think so often when we think about the concept of intellectual property, particularly patents and copyrights, um, we think about monetization and protection of innovation and our creativity, right? We think about like, how does this contribute to my ROI? And we don't necessarily think about those things in the context of how we can engage in reputation building and trust building, right? But from a US perspective, in the US Constitution, you are guaranteed the right to a patent or a copyright, which means that the founders of this country found some kind of value in actually having that trust building with innovators and saying, hey, if you're willing to share with us what it is you create, because we understand that society can benefit from that, we're willing to help you protect it for a limited period of time, right? So the, the core concept of intellectual property and intellectual property frameworks that have now been sort of propagated throughout the world really is at its heart about trust building between society and innovators and creators. And then beyond that, we can think about the ways that it engages or helps us promote reputation and trust building with our clients and our customers. Because having that intellectual property protection, getting that patent coverage, means that you actually have to make a disclosure to the public. You have to tell people about the secret sauce. Okay, And that means that in some way, shape, or form, you're adding transparency to your innovation process that customers can check up on. Now, I don't know how many people do actually read patents, right? but you could. And think of how many people do get excited when they say, oh, well, there's, there's a, this is patented, right? This AI software product is patented. Or even if there's a patent pending on it, there's value in that. 
And that gives the customer the understanding that somebody somewhere is vetting this, right? Um, so it does help us in reputation building around our brand, around our product lines, and also in helping build trust with respect to our customers. And I think in the age of generative AI, which I think is going to be a lot of our focus today, um, it's particularly important that we use every way we can to try and help build that trust with clients and customers. Great. Awesome. And then, you know, uh, we had an earlier discussion just with the three of us as we were exploring how to run this session. And of course, we were like, well, how does the law work? Like, how does all of this work? And, and Rachel had a really good suggestion to say, like, you know, the law is actually a byproduct of what we want to see in society. So I guess this question for, for Rachel is, you know, you have mentioned it'd be helpful to frame IP issues in the age of AI um, as like digital trust first versus law, I'd love for you to just kind of unpack that because I thought that was a useful like top level framework to kind of uh, before we get into the nitty gritty. Sure. Yeah. And it, and it really is kind of piggybacking on what Allison was just teeing up there too. You know, I think that for those of us who've been in this space practicing <clears throat> for at least the last decade plus, let's call it, my guess is it's probably been going for longer than that. Um, the gap between you know, the, the bleeding edge of innovation and what we've outlined from like even a case law, a case law angle, but certainly from a regulatory angle like that, that gap is just growing and growing and growing. And the complexity of the leading edge is just, you know, it's exponentially increasing. And I don't know if you all saw that. Um, it looks like the executive order is probably coming out from the White House on Monday. Like that'll be really interesting to see how far they've gotten into the actual trenches of, of actionable line items of what's expected for AI, because so far, you know, the Bill of Rights and some of these other kind of like leading um, documents, I guess I'll call them like, you know, sort of sort of advisory pieces that have come out have been pretty, you know, high level and really, really hard to action, right? When you get into the mix of how these systems actually work and where you actually need your protection. So when we talk about digital trust as opposed to sort of waiting for the regulatory scheme, which obviously is 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 not, you can't engage in this technology and wait for the regulatory scheme. It will be too, it'll, it'll be far too late. Um, but digital trust is more about, you know, seeing it through the lens of the ultimate user in society, seeing it, the, taking sort of a user-centric approach of how are we doing the best we can with the information we can right now to set up guardrails in the protection of like individuals and society as a whole. Um, and, and oftentimes that is also sharing those learnings across competitive landscapes. So in the past where maybe, you know, if I were at McKinsey still and, you know, and Allison and I would be kind of like indirect competition in some of these, some of these environments, maybe we wouldn't be sharing kind of our, our toolbox with how we execute on some of this technology and do it thoughtfully for our clients. Um, we're seeing a lot more of shared learnings, shared experience because we all know that the pitfalls are going to be potentially so great and so significant that, you know, kind of potentially losing out on a slight competitive edge is worth it for avoiding the significant pit pitfall coming, you know, coming right off to the side of you that you might not see coming in the way that these two data sources interact. It really creates something quite different than each of the data sources on their own, for instance. So, um, so I think that when we think about, you know, my organization is one, but every organization that I've supported and every organization that is thinking about leveraging this powerful technology at scale to drive impact for their ultimate clients, setting up a, a true north for their appetite and what they're actually trying, like the benefit that they're trying to glean for their users and the, you know, running the scenarios of, you know, what would, what, what are the possible you know, the, we used to call it the parade of horribles, right? Like what could possibly go wrong here and how do you set up guardrails for that? Um, that's going to be your, in my view, that's going to be a better guiding set of principles than trying to say, okay, well, where do we think the, the law is going here? Um, because I think that the, you know, we're seeing right now, even with the early pieces of kind of case law settling around generation of content, certainly on the generative AI space, like it's struggling with it a little bit. I think it really is kind of, it's, it, it's butting up against some of our core tenants that IP was built around and how we, how we determine what is valuable from an IP perspective. So really kind of having your own, your own internal organizational structure on how you, how you develop what you want the trust to be for your ultimate end user 
that's going to be a better, you know, better system to, to run against in my view than kind of where you think the regulatory scheme is going. Yeah, that, that's a really great framing. Uh, I would just echo, you know, a lot of times you see companies, they say, let's just use AI, but don't think about why and what do you want to use it for. So I love that framing that uh, I don't think it's right just for regulators to create laws without thinking, like, what do we even want as a society? So let's unpack that a little. I guess we talk a lot about, you know, generative AI. It's slightly different than traditional machine learning and AI models because it has the ability to generate things, right? Um, and it's not input-output driven. So the simplest example is if you go into Excel, again, recovering consultant. If you go into Excel and you do equals one plus one, you get two every time, right? Otherwise, your thing's broken. But... When you go into ChatGPT and you ask it a question, it gives you some flavor of answer, but you don't actually know what you'll get. So generative AI is very different in that sense. So I guess the question for both of you, maybe um, we can start with Allison, is like, as it relates to IP, like, what are the problems presented with, with generative AI? Are they new issues? Are they old issues? Like, how should you think about that? So that's a great question. I think uh, the good news and bad news here. The good news from my perspective is that a lot of the issues that we're facing surrounding intellectual property um, and generative AI are not necessarily wholly new. Um, a lot of these legal issues have been tackled by folks in the AI and IP policy field for, for years. So the good news is that there's a lot of smart people who have a good head start on addressing a lot of these problems. Um, unfortunately, not all of those people on, sit on judicial benches or in legislatures, but uh, a lot of these problems are already sort of in the pipe to be addressed. Now, what is kind of new is the scale and the speed at which the change is happening here and the muddling of, of data and input and output, right? So if we look at how much ChatGPT, and we'll just use that as an example of generative AI, has changed since last November, right? Um, you know, we're already almost two versions uh, increased now, and the amount of, of change that you're seeing is just drastic. Um, the new tools that come out, I feel like there's a new tool, uh, both customer facing and enterprise, every day. I feel They're like probably launching one now. as That's we speak, speech, right? right? Uh, there will be a new version of something. Um, and so, the good news about that is that the bad decision that you make for your organization today may be irrelevant three months from now. Uh, the bad news is that by the time it's irrelevant, it may have, if it's not irrelevant, it may have propagated to thousands or millions of people um, because of the scale at which these things are happening. The other problem uh, with respect to generative AI is attribution. Right? And I think this is somewhere that we're really getting stuck in the courts. I would love to hear what Rachel thinks about this. Um, and I think we're gonna continue to get stuck on this because since the input data sets are pulled so often from so many sources, and I'm not talking about closed systems that are internal to an organization, I'm talking about public uh, generative AI tools, um, those data sets are so muddled that attribution for any particular legal risk is gonna be really, really challenging. It's very hard to say, oh, you pulled this image from just Getty. You pulled this from just um, you know Britney Spears' song library. Um, and, and then to try to figure out like how much contribution happened um, with respect to any of those things. So I think that one of the big struggles that courts are having and a lot of lawmakers are having is with respect to attribution. And it's going to probably require some sort of shift in the way we think about these problems. For sure. Uh, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, on that last point, Allison, 100% agree. And, and I think we're seeing some of the, you know, some of the lead players coming out with, I can't remember exactly what the name was, but essentially like unlearning initiatives, right? Like trying to do kind of like hackathons in an unlearning way. Like how do we back out of some of these things with models, frankly, that, you know, none, none of us, even the ones who are developing them, developing them really understand how they're working. And so when you're talking about kind of, different data feeds coming in at different points in the life cycle of that model development, including now kind of looking internally at, at us and where we sit, like including taking that into an organization like mine, like anybody else's, we will continue to be a part of that, right? Like as you use these tools, you continue to train or tweak or whatever it is, but you're still feeding the beast. You are still having it continue to develop. And you might ultimately develop it off on this angle where it's not giving you 
the right information anymore because you don't have the right users, you know, prompting the right um, the right call. So um, that is a very difficult, if not, I think, currently impossible idea of really being able to back out so that if you, even if you can get to an attribution place and know what you're trying to pull out, how do you then go and pull it? I think like these are really complex questions um, that I think we remains to be seen exactly how that works. And right now it's kind of like, it's a one-way street, right? It's, and it, those, those are, those are kind of um, developing in a single direction. Um, you know, the other piece I would say about kind of the, I, I, I totally agree that I think that the problems are similar problems that we've dealt with before and they're just in a different scale and kind of at a different pace. Um, but I will say that I think, I think the development of original content at such incredible volume is something that we will at some point need to kind of take a breath and say, okay, are we still thinking about what is protectable in the right way, given how like the sheer volume coming at this point? And I can't remember exactly what the language is that the courts used with copyright law. And Allison, maybe you have this on the top of your head, but like the like the modic the modicum of you know creativity or like this like this little tiny nugget of creativity is what it took to kind of get copyright protection and you know there's i think we'll continue to see fussing around that when it comes to generated generated content from you know midjourney and you know all the others that are going to come after it and is that really what we are trying to protect like is that really what we want to serve as protectable content going forward or is there sort of like this new threshold for human interaction that is different from like looking at the output? Did it, did we kind of have like one nugget that equaled something new? Maybe there's like a whole new scheme that we kind of have to say, okay, well, what are humans doing that is really truly different than this, you know, new, very, very sophisticated, very, very smart um, technology that is protectable in a different way. And like, you know, it could be, this is, I, I'm sure it will never go this way. I hope it will never go this way, but you could you could almost see an argument to say, well, maybe it's more like the billable hours model of law firms where it's like you have to hit X amount of effort that you've put in and you have to kind of document that to then be like, there's ownership within it as opposed to it kind of having this like, you know, the, this this small piece of creative content um, that's different from from what else is out there or, you know, kind of originating from, this small piece of human interaction, you could see how that, we're, we're gonna continue to fuss around that for many, many months, I think. Yeah, and, and to frame um, what Rachel was saying about the scale of these things, uh, if you imagine like photography images, uh, it took, uh, whatever it took to cross a billion images, right, uh, was like about 15 years or 50 years or something, and like what you would expect, it took a lot of decades. Generative AI crossed that in six months, right? So the scale of this is, is, is not like, Exponential, like exponential, exponentially, right? So, so it's just a completely different paradigm. Um, I really love what both of you were saying. I think you've painted this picture of we're in this kind of messy middle, right? Uh, if you're a company, you can't just not do nothing, right? Uh, not, uh, you can't just sit back and say, well, whatever, we'll let other people figure it out because you might lose competitive advantage. And not only as a company, right, as a solo content creator, individual writer, everybody, right, that creates anything, but as both of you rightfully hi highlighted, uh, it's a little nebulous. Like, is it gonna screw my company? Is it gonna, you know, get me in trouble? But if I do it and have a competitive advantage, will I become a market leader? So it's very uncertain. I guess the question is, you know, given that regulatory frameworks and some of these rules and business models are still being invented, like how could companies be more thoughtful about it? And I will preference since both of you have a legal background, not legal advice by any means, uh, but maybe I'll open it up to both. Yeah, um, I, I want to kind of circle back to something that Rachel mentioned earlier, talking about True North and, and our compass, right? Because I think uh, that's what's kind of going to get us forward and get us where we're going. Um, there was a book that Kareem put me onto about two years ago when he held a similar event uh, called The Exponential Age. And if you haven't read it yet, I really recommend it. But the author there articulates a concept that we've all probably been feeling for the last two decades. Um, in which he talks about kind of what Rachel mentioned earlier, that we are now in this space where technology is advancing so quickly that regulatory agencies and lawmakers cannot keep up with it. And you know, traditionally, the backfill in industry has been through standards-making organizations. 
but the rate of change is now so fast that not even standards organizations can kind of keep up with these things. Like if we look at some of the AI standards that NIST in the US has been working on, I think it took them two and a half years to get to version 2.0, and those folks do this every day. So you can't sit around and kind of wait on regulatory guidance. It's not to say it's not important. Obviously, it's important for all of us. But you can't stop innovating while you wait for somebody to tell you what to do. And that means that as organizations within industries, we have to start talking to each other, sharing with each other, and being transparent about our moral compass and the way that we want to handle these issues. And I think there's kind of two ways to approach that that everybody should think about doing. Um, one of which is being transparent with respect to your own AI um, policy. At BCG, we call it the responsible AI policy. A lot of organizations are implementing these. And that's an outward-looking policy that's transparent. You're, you're public with it. You say, this is our core values surrounding the use of AI, the impact we want to have with the tools that we build, and the way we want to service our clients. Right. So that, that way, you have a clear understanding of what your no-fly zones are, the type of work you don't want to do, the impact you don't want to have. And that's going to make it a lot easier when situations do arise, because they're going to come up very quickly now, to just pull to that and say, uh, you know what, Like, we'd love to help with this work, but maybe, maybe this is not for us. right? Um, and it also allows partners, whether it's your vendors, whether it's you know, a subcontractor or a co-contractor that you want to do something with, to kind of get a sense of where you sit on, a, on these topics. right? Um, so that's one thing that I would suggest. The other thing is um, being very proactive about your generative AI policy. right? Set up a steer code that includes stakeholders from across the organization at different levels and iterate. It doesn't have to be perfect because generative AI is not perfect. You just want to get it out there and have a process by which you can get feedback right, from the people on the ground who are doing the work and who want to implement these tools internally or who want to innovate outwardly right, so that you can be continuously reviewing what it is they want to use and for what purposes because there's a new tool every day and you've got to find a safe way to sandbox it for people to play around and innovate or they will do it outside of it and you definitely don't want that. So I would say, you know, my thought is that establishing sort of an external facing policy that sets forth your true north and that you can share with other organizations and your clients and then also having an internal policy to help guide uh, creativity and innovation. Yeah, I, I would 100% agree with those. And I, I, I would maybe even build on the policy piece and say, you know, for sure that kind of infrastructure at an organization can be incredibly powerful. And also if you're able to figure out how to make it actionable across your organization, like opening up, as you called it, Allison, like sandboxing where folks can actually play with it almost independent of the tools. Like there's a new tool coming out and those of us who are kind of in these spaces where we have to pick and choose with them, like our inboxes are absolutely flooded every single day with like new offers to see new tools and it's it's really exciting but also we need to get all of the folks who are impacting our whatever our, our end product to our you know to our customer bases for mine obviously legal advisory um we have to get them playing with the technology at its core to understand like what is even possible here and so we do a lot of um we, what we call the the generative AI test kitchen where we have lawyers cycling through, and saying what are the what are like the big use cases that we should be prioritizing here for our client impact story because there's way too many to do all of them there's way too many to kind of you know throw a net around everything happening in the space um, but you do need to get your folks including folks who have historically wanted nothing to do with technology and unless you shove it down their throat everybody needs to be playing around with this it's coming from so many different angles that you know the way that you can any which way that you can make it digestible um, for them to be kind of playing around with it, that is, to me, that's like my number one focus from an internal perspective. And, and maybe on top of that, I would say, you know, design thinking skills have never been more important than they are right now of convincing. And again, remember, I sit with a bunch of lawyers. I am a lawyer, so I can say this with all the love in my heart. It is, you know, it is a group of fairly conservative used to being perfecting execution professionals. And we need to get to the place where it's like, you cannot wait for perfect here, obviously in the way that you use it for your client impact 100%. 
but you need to get in here and you need to play around with this and you need to fail at it. And you need to figure out like, why is this not working? Where, where am I missing potential impact stories for my clients? Um, and you, you know, as I tell my lawyers, I'm like, every lawyer now is a tech lawyer. Like that used to be my title that was differentiated from everybody else in, in, in practice. I'm like, everybody is a tech lawyer when it comes to this stuff. You, you have to, you have to have an understanding of its capability. Um, one, because your clients, you know, they deserve it and they're going to start demanding it, right? Like clients are waiting to see how this is going to impact you. But also we as a network from a society perspective, like probably, you know, the folks on this call and the folks in that room, you you represent a lot of the brains who are going to be helping us figure out how do we do this thoughtfully as a society. My, you know, my kind of mantra these days is like, everybody needs to pitch in. Everybody needs to be a part of thinking through like, where are the pitfalls? Where is the opportunity? How do we let this develop smartly on behalf of the practice of law, you know, but, but, you know, for society at large, like we hold the keys, you know, to the system of justice on our side. And that is a big responsibility to make sure that we are leveraging this technology appropriately. Um, and you can, that, that is true of a lot of different industries hold like particular pieces to this pie that are going to be so important for us as a society to not screw it up, to not let this technology run afoul and all of a sudden, you know, doing things that we can't undo. Yeah, there's a real risk, I think, as both of you are saying, the tragedy of the comments, right? Like, we all, this thing is out there, so putting it back in a box, that boat has long sailed and never was a thing anyways, uh, once you release it. But the question is, everybody has different incentives, and they sit in a different place, and all of that. Um, I wanted to kind of, you know, obviously bring the inter internet into this, right? It's, especially after COVID and all of that, and during the pandemic, we've also had a lot of time on the internet, uh, whether it's Zoom or social media and so on and so forth. Um, just going back even before that to set this up a little bit and frame it, um, I think modern IP law and copyright really started because this idea of copying became a thing. So I guess if we use a very simple example, uh, before the Gutenberg Press, which was invented 600 years ago, if you wrote a book, the only way I could read it is you give it to me, but then you don't have the book anymore. With the printing press, we're able to make mass copies, right? So then we could give it to everybody in this room. And so obviously, uh, Allison wrote a book. You wouldn't want people to steal and make money off of it because it's your work as a creator, right? Um, the internet changed all of that, right? Because the internet put copy and paste on steroids. <laughs> Right, because now I can send an email, I can send it to 100 people, I don't have to go like buy ink and copy something. It's, it, it, it basically made it frictionless. And now with Gen AI, as you both rightfully pointed out, it's exponential because I could you know, take a break for 15 minutes and create 100 images pretty easily. And they're all pretty mind-blowing and high quality. And these images, sometimes they took creators like months to create teams of people to create. So I guess the question is like, in this era of like the internet and generative AI and just like how this dynamic has changed, like maybe speak from the shoes of a creator because if we reason from that, we can reason from companies. Like what are we trying to protect? Like what's a good outcome? I'm a artist, I'm a writer, I write a piece, I want to put it out in the world because I want people to read it, but I also want to be rewarded for it because I put a lot of work into it. Like what are we ultimately trying to protect on the other side once we figure out this whole system? Listen, all of my mid-journey images of rainbow flying cats are amazing and completely sure. worth protecting. Um, so I, I think this is the million dollar, billion dollar question though, right? Is, and what Rachel was kind of mentioning earlier, what we've been kind of getting at is we, we're going to have to, as a society and, and globally, um, think about what it is that we value in creation and innovation, right? The idea has always been that there's this uh, this desire to want to incentivize creators and innovators by providing them with this protection, right? Um, and, and I think you gave sort of the camera example. We all love that one. And when I think about the camera example as applied to generative AI, it's like I set up a camera in this room, right? And I'm using the tool, the camera takes the picture, but I'm the one guiding it. But now somebody has just moved the McDonald's logo in and somebody has also moved you know, a whole bunch of pictures that are copywritten work from the Alvin Ailey dance troupe in. And they're just moving this in my frame without me saying necessarily anything about it. And I'm like, all I really want is this picture of this fantastic group of people who are watching this lecture. I'm like, no, no, what you really need is the McDonald's logo right there. That's gonna make this better. Um, and so 
it's hard to try to say, try to to nail down that nugget of creativity. Is the creativity mine in using a tool to generate some sort of visualization of the people in this room? Um, is it the the fact that I did that and then combined with other images that just happened to be there? Because what if the fact that I want to make an image of this room, what I originally make is like, well, that's boring. Nobody wants it. But the one with the McDonald's logo in it, and I'm not picking on McDonald's. It's just what came to mind. Um, the one with that logo in it is the one that people are willing to pay like bored apes money for, right? That's the one they want. So that's the one that has monetary value. And I think that's part of where we're struggling with respect to a lot of these things is trying to sort out where that nugget of innovation lies. Is it in the prompt engineering? I mean, I think that's the easy place to look is we're going to start seeing more and more creative and detailed. And we're already seeing this, this transition of people getting very elaborate and specific with prompt engineering. And at some point, there's an inflection point where it goes from Allison typing in a generic prompt for rainbow flying cats to a very specific paragraph long prompt about exactly what I want those cats to look like and I want it in the style of a Van Gogh painting and I want the rainbow <laughs> in the upper left, right? And so somewhere it starts to be very specific with respect to what I want to create. And you can kind of imagine that that output has a high degree of creativity and a lot of human interaction and engagement, kind of what Rachel was talking about with sort of the, the degree, and maybe that's protectable. But I think it's gonna be really hard to draw that line between my sort of like one line generic prompt about rainbow cats and you know my paragraph that creates this beautiful Van Gogh painting of a cat. Rachel? Yeah, and, and I I want I 100 percent agree. And I'm looking at the chat happening that I can see that you guys can't see too about like, well, what about the elements where someone's to your point, Allison, like very very much interacting with the AI and kind of the AI is a tool, the AI is not a creator necessarily, right? And there's sort of there, there's gradient there for sure. And I think we'll see the courts continue to to razor their way down on that. And I think there's value in that. I guess I just also think that like it might be kind of missing the point because if if you know, if we all can go in and we can all generate this like brand new, incredible content, you know, so quickly and so easily, are we going to, are we going to see less potential infringement anyway? Right. And so sort of you're, you're starting to kind of like lay this very different landscape than what we've seen to date of like, you know, setting up the perfect, perfect photo and getting, you know, the national geographic photographer who's sitting in one of those like bunker style things for 48 hours to get that bird doing that amazing dance. And, you know, it's, it's like the only person who was able to ca capture that image. If I can go in and basically just be like, yeah, I kind of created it myself in mid journey. Are we going to start to see some of these, like, you know, we're yelling into a void as content owners, content creators that no one really cares because they're out there kind of like creating different content anyway. So I just think that there's some interesting, there's some interesting reasons to take like a big step back and start to think about well what is the what is like the the competitive content landscape look like in five years right when there's like so much at the fingertips of every single human with or without experience in you know like it's not even photoshop anymore right like it it, it is really kind of it is an equalizer and so what does that look like and then what are we trying to protect given what that landscape is likely to look like, like what is the what are the pieces that we want to hold as true creativity versus, you know, the way that we've kind of thought about it to date? I don't know the answer to that, but I think that there's going to be, you know, I think there's a there's a potential for a significant shift in like what are we actually trying to protect is slightly different than it has been in the past. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a really great uh call out because Going back to a point you mentioned earlier too, there's no way to also do attribution. So if we made this image, did it was it built on Allison's image? Was it built on your image? Was it a split image that you both then remixed on something else? Like those issues will definitely come up. Um, just referencing the camera example, uh, when photography like first became a thing, it wasn't copyrightable because the question is like, yeah, you clicked a button. But then I think we've all seen beautiful photographies, which is really, you know, lack of a better term, amateur photography. And we would say, well, yeah, the beautiful shot of like Mount Everest or something probably is worth something. And ultimately, the, uh, I love the creativity point because I think as a society, one framework and one way to think about it is if you created something creative, you created value, you have to capture value. 
to capture value, you need a regulatory landscape, you need a business framework, you need how we want to coordinate. Uh, we didn't really touch on this um, too much here, but you know the world's also global, so how we feel in this jurisdiction is very different than across the pond, than in Asia, than everywhere else, and also people on the internet who believe in open source believe something different versus you know, top-down company. So I, I think in our prep, we called it the blob, right? So this is the blob we kind of have to navigate. Um, I guess maybe before I open it up to the audience, just like very quickly, like if there was one thing society had to figure out first, or like one risk maybe that we have to overcome, like where are the blind spots? Like what is, what is that one thing that we should be like thinking more maniacally about that we aren't today? I would just double down on kind of what Rachel and I were just talking about and, and the idea that we really have to think very carefully about what it is that we value in creativity and innovation and what we want to protect, right? And we have that right to, to patents and copyrights and have um, trademarks and trade secrets, but just because those things exist doesn't mean that they will always, always exist in the same form and you know, for the same duration. And I think that we have to think very carefully about what it means to be a human innovator or a human creator. Um, you know, a, a, the art example is a really easy one here because I think we can all sort of visualize it. But the art world, just since the inception of photography, there have been filters. There are you know, all these ways you can tweak images now. And I think you'll be hard pressed to find anything in the National Geographic Gallery that hasn't been edited in some form or fashion, right? And so there's been a creep for a while with respect to just photography and to increasing amounts of digital overlay and digital adaptation. And, um, and, and so generative AI, again, speeding that up at scale, like at what point is it no longer you know, something that we find creative, but does that still make it not protectable? And Maybe it is protectable, but is there really value to society in protecting this, right? So there's two separate questions. One, when does something become or stop being protectable based on the tool that's used? And two, do we care? Like at what point do we no longer care because the volume, as Rachel said, is so high and so many people can do this so easily that it just doesn't really make sense. There's not a huge benefit to society in even taking the time it takes or the expense it takes. I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer. I think about things in time and money. Um, and the expense that it takes to file that copyright, right? Maybe there's not. Maybe by the time that I file that and the copyright office puts a stamp on it, like much less the patent process, which takes years, but by the time the copyright office puts a stamp on it, we've moved on. We don't care anymore about my cat photos. So. You know, I think those are the things I would say we really need to think about carefully. Yeah, I, I'm, that was mine too, but I'll, I'll come up with a different one, Allison, but I would double down on that. I, the other piece that I think that we really need a shift quickly, and this is kind of piggybacking on something we talked about earlier. Um, you know, in the old days of SaaS software, right? The old days of maybe 10 years ago, um, you were really able to kind of like hand the baton of responsibility and risk from, you know, from from entity to entity, from person to person of like, I got you to this place. Now it's yours. You know, you have to, an organization needed to get up to speed on where we, where they, they kind of caught that baton and learn, you know, what their, what the risk infrastructure was that they needed to kind of properly administer and deploy and whatever that technology. Um, it was much easier to kind of like, and, and even if you look at how GDPR, the privacy schema coming out of um, the EU is structured, it's like, it's kind of a zero sum game, right? Like somebody has more responsibility than the other. And like, depending on who's got what, like which side of the, of the coin someone's on, you know, they kind of have more of the responsibility, less the responsibility. Now the the, the new regulatory draft coming out of that's, you know, getting, getting finished up here out of the EU for AI is more like, it's not like that. It's not a zero sum game, right? Like everybody who participates in the development and deployment and continued reliance and use of these systems, it's alive. We're going to keep impacting it. We're going to keep developing it. We're going to keep deploying it. Like it changes, but I'm, I'm talking generally about AI systems. It changes as we continue to use it. And so we're going to really need vendors and users and end customers. Like we all need to be kind of working together to attack you know, transparency and, and like 
robustness of a system and trends towards bias, depending on what kind of system they are and who they're impacting. Those are no one user in that chain can tackle those problems. Like they need to be collective. So there needs to be a lot more collaboration across these pieces of the vendor user pie. So whatever organization you're in, wherever you're you're heading off to, you're likely going to be a new node in this infrastructure. And we all need to be participating in like the collective thinking about whether or not things are going well and how we all, you know, how we all support the kind of the, the watermark for society raising with this technology, as opposed to trying to be like, no, no, it's cool. You're going to indemnify me. I'm just going to go over here. I know I built the system, but it's kind of a black box. You good luck. That's not going to work. And for me, any vendor that tries to come at me with that sort of a, a posture, I'm like, it's it's not even worth starting the conversation because I, I, I can't do anything with your technology. I need you to be with me at the table thinking through the big, potentially existential issues that are going to be coming our way. And I know they're coming. So I think this like, you know, society having a more collaborative posture in this space is critically important in my view. Great. Awesome. Um, certainly a lot more we could kind of peel the onion and unpack. I wanted to leave some time for audience questions. So maybe we start with folks in the room and then I know we have uh, questions online as well. Um, so we'll do that. Great. Um, I think I saw Sa Sava, right? Sava, yeah. yeah. So uh, two examples which are um, in music, like you could play like two seconds of a music clip on TV before you have to like pay for it or two or three seconds, something like that uh, on the music side. And in the fashion side, you have like Zara, which says like they take a photo, they change like I think it's five or seven things and then it's considered original. So I, is it that industries are ultimately going to decide on this? And is it going to take a startup like the, the modern day Napster to push the boundary and then ultimately have a judge decide on what's original and not? Because it's it's it feels like where the money lies is going to drive the conversation on that. Um, I'll take a first stab at that, I guess. Um, so I would say on some level, I think we're already kind of past the Napster point. Um, I, I do think there's going to be a lot of changes and industries are kind of in the spirit of collaboration going to sort of start to have handshake thoughts on how they're just going to handle things. But you're kind of talking well, on the copyright side about fair use exceptions and that's where the courts are getting stuck right now, right? And so if you look at some of like the Getty Images cases, some of the other cases that come out, have come out, they're looking um, at the output of these tools and saying, okay, well, We'll, we'll kind of skirt over this idea of whether or not it's derivative, right? And, and if we just kind of assume that it is, you know, without an, an awful lot of comment, then can we get it under a fair use exception, right? Because it all goes away if we can give it some kind of exception. And they're getting stuck there, and I've seen some really interesting sort of mental gymnastics happening on the legal side with respect to monetization value, right, of the potential derivative work. And so I think, yes, I think we will get to a point where that happens, but I think it's kind of gonna be a Band-Aid, right? on top of a lack of understanding and a lack of willingness to ask those deeper questions. And maybe that's the band-aid that we stick on it to just get us there, like, oh yes, if, if you make thousands of cat pictures, we're just, that's fine, like that's fair use. Uh, but I don't think that that really resolves the underlying problem. And, and maybe just to layer on that, I think your second example was Zara, right? Was like a fashion knockoff yeah. example. And this is another piece where I think it's it's evident that, you know, the law isn't quite catching up. Like fashion is different because it still is kind of considered more function and less creative, right? And we had the Star Athletica case that kind of moved in that direction. Um, but, you know, for, for years, the fashion industry has been, for decades, the fashion industry has been, you know, campaigning for fashion to be a part of sort of like the creative bucket and like copyright protectable and it still isn't quite you know making the headway that it that it needs to so i think like this is exactly the problem it's a it's a totally different framing but again it's like exactly the problem of what we were talking about that sort of what we i think collectively today a lot of people would probably agree like there's definitely creative value there there's definitely things that should be protectable in sort of like the way a garment is constructed because there's a whole industry around how creative it is but 
it's not quite there yet. Um, and then folks are just having to kind of like go ahead and, you know, try and fight with the czars of the world and the H&Ms of the world anyway. And if I could just add a, an interesting point to that, you know, I, I know that we're trying to talk about this from sort of like an IP risk perspective, but some of these tools are being used to do things in a really IP preserving way. Think about fashion, right? I know in February, the New York Fashion Week, like there were some designers who got in trouble because whether or not they were trying to like punk people, they released entire lines that were used, made using generative AI, and people kind of called them out on it. They're like, well, these buttons don't even line up, they go nowhere. Like, um, so you couldn't even make those clothes. But the designers didn't say that up front, right? So it was unclear as to whether or not they were trying to make a, a broader point or whether or not they were trying to field test if people are interested in this kind of clothing. Um, but there are some fast fashion brands that in the spirit of trying to do things sustainably have actually decided to use generative AI to produce um, images of the types of fashion they want to make and then they field test that in the market to see if people would actually buy it and they don't build a thing until after they determine there's an actual market for those different clothes. And in that way, they've actually been able to reduce waste and reduce excess product by sort of using generative AI in a fast, creative way to help try to like make minor changes to trending things and you know, not, hopefully not rip people off and not create a whole bunch of excess waste, which is a big problem within the fashion industry. So there's ways of, of around it and of doing that in an IP responsible way. And that's gonna to have to be like an industry thing that we come together on. Um, I wanna just take a question from the digital audience because I think it's um, a really good one. So uh, in the age of AI, you know, the cost of cognition and creativity kind of goes to zero. Do you see a world, and maybe building on Sava's question, do you see a world where there's just no IP law? And it's, you know, we don't have, or such a restrictive framework, I guess, is maybe the other side. But it appears to get both your thoughts. I'm the last one, so Rachel, do <laughs> sure. I'll, I mean, I that is pretty dark, right? That is a pretty dark space to get to. I, I think maybe going back to at least where my head sits right now. No, I don't think it goes down to zero because I think I think there will still always be difference between human creativity and our leveraging of these tools. How we define that, I think, is going to be increasingly like up for debate, right? And I think that like the, the the old school ways that we, the way it's articulated in the constitution, the way that like, you know, the case laws come down, I think that this is a major pivot in that, um, in that framework that we probably need to take a step back and be like, what does it actually mean to be human? What does it actually mean to be creative in using the tools and not using the tools? And how do we articulate a way to define that so that, you know, I can come to the table as a human and say, this is what I did. Um, as opposed to, you know, a, a machine essentially being able to, to potentially put out the exact same output. Right. Um, so, so no, I don't think, I don't think it goes down to zero, but I do think that we, we need to tackle some sort of like existential questions of like, what, who am I like, hello world, who am I and why am I here? And, um, and, and it, that's going to be, a, a, I mean, I hope that I can be a part of that conversation. I think that's going to be really interesting, but yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not quite to that thinking yet, if it, it seems. Yeah, I, I would echo that 100%. I think, uh, definitely we want to have a, a conversation about how it's going to change. We're going to have to have a conversation about how it's going to change, but I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Maybe that's just wishful thinking on my part because at the end of the job, um, but I, I do think there's going to be a massive shift. Uh, but I think we're always going to have a fundamental sense of fairness that we need to protect people's efforts, right? And what that looks like is going to be different. Um, but I don't think that's going to go away because I think that's part of who we are socially as human beings. Yeah, there's a great quote I like. is like, every abundance creates deep scarcity and you want to protect and make money and create value off of what's scarce. So, great. Um, we'll take uh, probably one or two more questions. Uh, Carmen. Uh, thank you. Can I just speak with a mic? Or... Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. So I have a quick question on the data side. So I've seen all contracts nowadays, they change the data provision from, I guess, licensing to enterprise data use, for example, to um, to licensing only um, without um, um, generally an LM use case, right? So exclude LM use case from the licensing rights. My question is, how do we define what is LM, what's machine learning traditionally? Do you guys have guidance on that? Because I feel it can be murky. 
Well, I think, I mean, an LLM is a specific model, so I think that one is an easier delineation. Like, we will not use the data as input for an LLM. I think it's trickier when you say generative AI broadly, right? And maybe that's part of the pushback if you're the one, you know, licensing the data. It's like, oh, well, or, or who is, is trying to get the data license? Right? Say, we'll carve these out into specific models. Um, but, you know, the, the challenge and it's kind of similar to blockchain, is that once you've put the information in, you really can't get it back out, right? So you have to think very critically as an organization about the nature of the input. You don't want to be putting your IP in a publicly available tool that's going to be out there for anybody, unless you specifically do want to do that, but do it with intention, right? Um, and, and you certainly want to be very thoughtful and careful about any PII or sensitive information that comes anywhere near that tool. Right, unless it's closed and for internal purposes only. So um, yes, I, I, I see where you're kind of coming from and that's definitely a consideration with licensing agreements. I think you've got to be kind of careful in how you're laying that out so that you're spelling out specific models um, if that's what you're trying to protect. Great, uh, gentlemen in the back. Since the solution of a generative AI problem and its result are inscrutable. We don't know what goes on inside, and we can't explain it, we can't interpret it. So what protection does the law provide for generative AI? Is it just the output that about which properties cannot be proven? Uh, can you elaborate on that? When you say for generative AI specifically, you mean like what is protectable about the, you're asking like whether the outputs could be protected, whether they hit. Well, I'm, large language models cannot be explained. We, we don't know how they work. Yeah. That means explanation. And then when they produce a result, we don't, there isn't a technical or a theoretical means by which we can interpret it back into the motivating domain. Yeah, yeah. So, it, it like, it's, uh, they are constrained by what you call guardrails, which are entirely empirical things. But the, I'm, I'm asking you that, that how can you take something where the intellectual content is inscrutable and then protect it as IP? So maybe I'll frame this first because it's an area I've been researching. I think this goes back to the attribution problem. So let's just uh, set a baseline. If you have a large language model or any generative AI model, if you take Allison's image out of it, right, um, but it still produces something similar kind of to her style for a bunch of other reasons, does Allison get to claim that, hey, that looks like my image kind of thing, or is it the model does that? So we have that problem, which I think you're describing. Um, I think the area of research that's been really challenging and some companies that try to solve this is around attribution. So the best case scenario is a model produces an image, we know 40% of it is Allison, 30% is Rachel, the rest is me, right? And then the image we know is like the first version of a Gen AI model created by whatever stable diffusion version something. So with that, then you have, like, you know, if Google wants to use that image, well, Allison gets a 40% cut, 30%, 30%, right? The problem with attribution that's really tough, um, and, and, and just kind of to answer your question, there isn't really an approach right now. A company called Stable Attribution tried to kind of build this whole thing, and what they actually did was they did, you know, did a bunch of experiments, and they put a bunch of Star Wars characters into the model, and then created an image that looked like a Star Wars character, and asked the, their tool, did this get created from Star Wars uh, characters? And uh, the model was able to say, yes, there was some, but the model created a different style that was never in the model to begin with. So you, you're um, protecting effort and not content. So, but this is the point of the whole talk. Like, is the goal to protect effort? There's that people, but there might also be people who want to protect content. Right? My point is in order to protect content and have this discussion, you need attribution rails. And attribution rails is a really hard problem. So like the end of that story is that if it creates an image that kind of looks like these Star Wars characters, but in this like impressionist style that was never trained on the model, what you might create an unintended consequence is a bunch of corporate legal teams starting to go after small creators and be like, that clearly looks like Star Wars, even though the painting had an element of it that wasn't Star Wars, right? And so the moral the end of the story is the project shut down because it wasn't a useful tool. But I bring up that example to just highlight like the concept of attribution is really hard. 
we take for granted when you read a book is it's like by Rachel, by Allison, so we know it's by them. It's in a database somewhere. Uh, with AI, it's completely, like you rightfully pointed out, sort of like it's completely, there isn't a paradigm. And so, but the technology exists, it's getting a lot of adoption and usage. So the framework almost has to take that constraint into hand and be like, in a world where we can't attribute, what are we protecting? And it might land in the world of like software code, right? There's a bunch of code, we don't always know the output, but there are, there's GitHub, right? And people have licenses and repositories and all, but that's one state of the world. And there isn't, like we're so early in this space, there isn't consensus in like what that is. And I think what Rachel and Allison really push everyone running an organization, individual and all of that, is to somehow try to get to consensus, knowing that that itself might even be a unicorn we can ever achieve. Um, I know we're a little bit over time, so thanks all for the question. We'll all be around this weekend, so feel free to ask us more questions, but I appreciate the attention, and thank you for listening.